today to tap into the vibrant stream of anti-caste epistemologies that served as inspiration for Baba Sahib. In conversation with Pragya Tiwari, they discuss Baba Sahib's life and journey. Our first speaker for today, Shashi Tharoor, a third term member of parliament for Thiruvananthapuram, is the best-selling author of 24 books, both fiction and non-fiction, besides being a former undersecretary for, of the United Nations and a former minister of, of state for human resource development and for external affairs in the government of India. Welcome. Sumit Samos is a writer, artist, an anti-caste student activist from Odisha. He recently published a book titled Affairs of Caste, A Young Diary. His research interests are caste, cosmopolitan elites, Dalit Christian history, and student politics. Welcome. Pragya Tiwari is a strategy and culture consultant, creative director of Oejo Media, and co-founder of the Indian History Collective. As a journalist, she has written extensively on politics, identity, policy, and culture, and has edited several publications, including The Helka, The Big Indian Picture, and Vice. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our guests, Shashi Tharoor, Sumit Samos, with Pragya Tiwari. Thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes? Thank you very much. Um, so we are about a week away from Republic Day um, when uh, we celebrate India's constitution. But to be honest, any day when we sit down to talk about Baba Sahib Ambedkar is a good day. The immediate pretext, of course, is uh, the prolific Dr. Tharoor's uh, recent book, which is a concise and scholarly biography of Dr. Ambedkar. And we also have with us Sumit, who um, is many things, um, but has written a wonderful uh, memoir, uh, a book called Affairs of uh, Caste, which is uh, about uh, his journey as an Ambedkarite, amongst many other things. Um, so uh, Dr. Tharoor, first of all, congratulations Thank on you. yet another winner, and welcome. Um, as I was saying, there's, um, you know, there's, there can never be enough said about Ambedkar, but uh, we have quite a few biographies out there, which I'm sure you've read as well. What made you take up this book, and what were you hoping to explore with it? Well, all the good ones seem to be rather mammoth. So I wondered you know, how many would actually be read by the sort of TikTok generation. Uh, there seemed to be um, a need for a concise treatment of the life and the legacy in a way that was accessible to uh, people in today's impatient world. And it seemed a good inflection point to do this because he sadly passed away at the age of 65. It's been exactly 65 years since, I mean, at least when I began uh, researching and, and writing this book. And so it seemed to me that probably this was the moment to look back on the life from exactly the amount of distance that he had lived and, and, and see, see where he had, what had become of him uh, since he left us. And what's striking, there were two things that really struck me when I was uh, uh, contemplating this project. One was the apparently undebatable fact that the Indian who has the most statues to him around the country is Dr. Ambedkar. There's a debate as to whether Mahatma Gandhi might beat him to it. Uh, but journalists traveling through have said there is no village in India which doesn't have at least a bust of Ambedkar. There are some that don't anymore have busts of Gandhi. So that's the extraordinary uh, extent of his reach. The other amazing detail was back in 2011 or so, there was a, an online poll conducted by two television channels on the greatest Indian of all time. I mean, Adi Shankar out to uh, Narendra Modi sort of thing. And um, everyone assumed this is a foregone conclusion Mahatma Gandhi would win. And there were literally 20 million people voted. And the winner was Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. Now, this was extraordinary at various levels, not least because in his own lifetime, something like this would have been unthinkable. He was somebody who was controversial. He lost more elections than he won. Uh, he was uh, 
frequently attacked in his own lifetime, and that such a figure has now become an unchallengeable icon with every political party trying to lay claim to some aspect or all of his le legacy, made me ask myself, so what is it that this gentleman has, has done and stood for? And I must say, the more you read of him and by him, and he was prolific, and there's a man whose output is estimated at 17,500 pages. The government of Maharashtra embarked on an exercise in publishing his collected works. There are 26 volumes into it, and people are saying it'll take another 26 volumes to cover the whole lot. I don't know how many of you have heard of writers who published after their death. But after Ambedkar died, three more books came out. He had so much written, unpublished stuff on his desk that they were compiled in three further volumes. So this is a prolific man. But the more you read of him, the more you get absolutely into admiration for his intellect, his mind, his spirit, uh, uh, and, and what Arundhati Roy dubbed his searing insolence. This is a man who's prepared to take on any um, uh, sort of bit of received wisdom and challenge it with a, a, a strikingly original mind. And all of this made him a, a worthy object of, of the biography. This is, plus he had gone through hell. Yeah. He'd really, really endured the most awful discrimination, oppression, humiliation that various stages of his childhood and youth. And to rise above them, to achieve a series of distinctions that frankly, people born to a life of privilege wouldn't have come close to. I mean, he was one of India's first uh, students in America, uh, one of the first PhDs out of Columbia. And those were the days when many prosperous and upper caste people used to print on their cards BAF. The F was for failed. But you know, BA failed because at least we got that far kind of thing. And here's a man who, who not earns one doctorate but two, one from Columbia, one from London, then also qualifies for the bar, uh, writes original, strikingly original papers in fields he's not even supposed to be a scholar in, like sociology. Uh, he is an economist of considerable repute. Um, he was the leading authority on provincial taxation in the British Raj and an expert on the British manipulation of Indian currency and the Indian rupee uh, during the, the uh, early 20th century. Amartya Sen called him the father of his own economics. So you, you got this incredible polymath, this mind fecund and fertile and adaptable. Uh, and, and at the same time, somebody who then gets into politics becomes uh, the leading voice of his community very quickly. By the time of his 20s, he's testifying before British constitutional commissions. Uh, he's somebody who speaks for the Dalit people at two roundtable conferences. He gets elected to the Bombay legislature. He's named to the Viceroy's Executive Council. And of course, then he becomes the first law minister in India's uh, first cabinet to the moment of independence. So you've got a glittering resume, which honestly, it's very difficult to think of anybody who can even come close to it, uh, even in that extraordinary generation of freedom fighters um, who were around at the time of independence. So given all of that, and then the crowning glory that he chaired the drafting committee that gave us this amazing constitution, um, this this is gen a gentleman whose life takes takes your breath away, and it's definitely worth knowing about. I mean, I hope to unpack a lot of that in the five minutes that we have left. But uh, you know, Sumit, I wanted to come to you uh, very I didn't quickly. Didn't talk that long. <laughs> no, no, it, it's not you. It's on JLF. It's not on you. Um, but. Uh, uh, Sumit, I just, I mean, it, it seems to me that the impetus for both of your books was kind of similar from my reading, from my vantage point. Um, you wanted to read, uh, reach uh, sort of wider readership uh, to talk about some of the things that contextualize our past and our present, right? Um, and your book, uh, like Dr. Tharoor's book, is part biography, part sort of uh, commentary on his legacy. Yours is part memoir, part social anthropology. Um, I want to start with a very basic question to you, Sumit, which is, what does it mean for you to be called an Ambedkarite or call yourself an Ambedkarite, as you might choose, in today's times? Well, uh, I think in the recent past four to five years, uh, post Rohit Vimala's uh, institutional murder in Hyderabad Central University because of caste discrimination, and after that, uh, you had uh, big Dalit mobilizations like the UNA, where uh, Dalits were stripped naked and beaten uh, on the streets. Uh, UNA, then you had uh, Dilution of Fascist Prevention of Atrocities Act, you had Hathras, 
and uh, in the, in the, at the same time you had uh, a digital media boom where you have this new uh, you know youtube channels uh, and different mediums through instagrams and facebook where people started uh, talking about these events and prior to that i mean that is where i got my uh, of anti-caste history i got i started reading scholars such as gay lombet elena jellet christopher jaffelot uh, g alosius brother and money and a whole range of scholars vernacular scholars who are not really taught in universities and uh, jangam chinaya who is a dalit historian uh, he writes on south asia uh, when he was in jnu in 1995 he says that there was hardly any book on ambedkar and prior to that uh, till late 1980s except for Maharashtra government, which because of a lot of from Ambedkar groups started to publish um, Ambedkar's work, uh, most of them till 19, late 1980s, even universities were not willing to associate with Ambedkar's works, publications. And that is an uh, accusation that most Ambedkarites and Dalits make that, uh, that Ambedkar had been erased, except for two to three stamps at that point of time. I mean, even before Ambedkar, it was Motilal Nehru and uh, Indira Gandhi's uh, portraits you find in parliament. It's only in 1990, in the heights of uh, Dalit mobilizations, and that those Dalit mobilizations also happens post-violence. In Andhra Pradesh, you have something called Karamchilu and Chunduru, where the dominant caste, they go on massacres um, of Dalits, and prior to that, it was mostly either limited to Maharashtra, a little bit of Uttar Pradesh with Scheduled Caste Federation and the Republican Party of India, a little bit of Tamil Nadu, but that is the time where they take Ambedkar as a symbol to fight against uh, this. And when I went to universities, I was not aware of all of this. I mean, I never found this in my lectures. I never found it in the courses that I took. I never found it in, uh, even in a place like JNU, which is a highly politicized space, you could see Ambedkar portraits, but you would never really engage with his thoughts and his ideas. Uh, there were seniors uh, from different parts of India who came and who told me about these stories. And in fact, the leading Dalit uh, intellectuals of this day, be it Sukhdev Thorat, Gopal Guru, or uh, you know, uh, even other lower caste intellectuals like G. Aloysius, all of them, even Kanchaila for that matter, all of them, they come from that legacy that Ambedkar was erased for a very long time and now they took it up, right? Um, so that was my introduction. And then I started reading a lot of things. I started traveling across India and I started to realize what does it mean for a Dalit person who is a Christian in Tamil Nadu? What does Ambedkar's ideas of conversion mean to him? Uh, I come from Orissa um, and I wanted to understand what does Ambedkar mean in this place where you have a majority tribal population and there is one Dalit community, right? So that is where I talk about micro histories in my book. Um, but yes, I, ha I also have my suspicion. Suspicion as in, when Ambedkar was alive, if you, I mean, both Congress as well as Hindu Mahasava, even communists, many of them would call him sellouts, uh, you know, sellout and uh, agents of the imperialist. Uh, in, in, when he joins Viceroy's Executive Council, they blame him, they call him names. And during Pune Pact, uh, they, uh, they call him all sorts of names. Even popular academic historians like Sumit Sarkar or uh, Sekhar Bandapadhyay, even Bipin Chandra, they almost tend to, um, you know, present Ambedkar as the villain, right? And that, when I read all of that, I realized that we need to reconstruct history. And that is what it means to be uh, um, Ambedkarite, right? to reconstruct those histories of different parts of India. Um, the other thing, what it means for me to be Ambedkarite right, is to, uh, to really stand, the, to really, uh, go back and look at some of the predictions that Ambedkar had ma made, you know, back then. Ambedkar said that uh, um, Hindu Raj, if Hindu Raj becomes a fact, it, it would be the greatest calamity that this country would ever see. Uh, and uh, it is incompatible with democracy, right? Uh, and uh, it is opposed to the ideas of liberty, equality, fraternity, and these are something that we see today with increasing violence against Muslims, uh, with uh, uh, and Ambedkar was a strong pro uh, proponent of uh, separation of executive and judiciary. And today we see uh, with uh, the Loya case and uh, many other, you know, landmark judgments that are coming, uh, you know, the, the influence of the state, the e executive in the judiciary. Um, the other predictions that he made, such as, you know, separate electorate was something that was in his mind for a very, very long time, right? He said, uh, we... Of course, at times, he wanted joint electorates on the base of adult franchise. 
But separate electorate was something that he was fighting all along his life. He said Dalits should vote for themselves. They should represent. They should elect their own representatives who rep who talk about their interests. Otherwise, they would become uh, Uncle Toms. You know the. Uh, dominant uh, caste leadership led political parties would try to control them. So that is something that we see and I really believe uh, that. The other thing that I really wanted to talk about what it means to be Ambedkar in this context is of course um, you know this idea of uh, separate settlement. I mean there's something that you know people might uh, get shocked when I talk about I mean when I say separate settlement. You go across India, Tamil Nadu, Orissa, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, you go across India, you will find Dalits on the outskirts. In Tamil Nadu, it's called Cheris. In Andhra Pradesh, it's called Velivadas. So you have Dalits on the outskirts. And Ambedkar said, look here, if you live in the village life with the upper caste Hindus, they have a Hindu code of life. And that is not of a mutual you know, coexistence. They, it's going to impact you. And then he also said, uh, look, you need to have uh, when you're in the village, you're, they're not going to allow you to do any sort of trade and occupations and other, f other kind of occupations because they're not going to deal with you. And that is something that I've seen very up close. Orissa, Tamil Nadu, uh, even in Kerala, I mean, Mr. Thuri is from Kerala, where Dalits live in colonies, the, some thousands and thousands of colonies, they, they, they live in segregation. Ambedkar, Ambedkar believed in autonomy at the end. And for me, what it means to be Ambedkar is to be autonomous. Uh, autonomy in the way that to reclaim my agency, to reconstruct my history, my ancestors' history, but also to build institutions. I mean, popular media, I mean, recently, uh, I mean, if you see, uh, the, I mean, there was an article by Yogendra Yadav uh, in the print. How many of, uh, you know, the journalists and anchors in these big media houses um, are, are from Dalit, Loka, so Adivasi communities? None. Very few, you know, hardly less, less than 2 3 percent you will find. Um, cinema. Uh, other affairs of life, uh, you know, governance. Recently, just two, three days back, uh, there was a survey that came out which said almost 98% of the top five IITs have Apaka Sindhus, right? So, and Ambedkar was constantly fighting for this representation, right? Representation in administration. Um, there was a committee that he was part of, which is called the START Committee, uh, in the, in, from between 1920 to 1930, where he's demanding that we want representation in services administration, right? And if you see the top excellence of bureaucracy, the joint secretaries, um, or the influential positions in, in, in bureaucracy, even in the state levels, or railways and banking, all these public sectors, even that you see, um, that is slowly getting eroded. I mean, there is no, uh, the, the idea of representation, you know, to be part of the governance, to be part of the decision making is not something that is being allowed. And for me, that, it what, that is what it means to be Ambedkar. Thank you, Sumit. And I think uh, the book you've written and the Panthers for that your publisher, I think they are they're making steps in the, that direction by telling you know your own stories. Um, uh, but Dr. Tharoor, let me correct myself if it wasn't clear. You didn't speak for too long. I mean, frankly, both of you could have spoken for 50 minutes each uh, without a single interruption from me and it wouldn't have been enough. Um, but you mentioned so many different things and you correctly like uh, identified um, Ambedkar as a polymath, there's so much to unpack there. But one uh, personal grouse that I have is that uh, we speak too little of his contribution to uh, the discourse in India on women's rights. Yeah. And you um, uh, called him, I think it was in an interview, uh, 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 you know, India's, India's first, first head, feminist. First real uh, feminist. Uh, great, anyway. uh, real feminist. I'm, I'm very curious to, to hear what, uh, how you meant that. Well, you know, it's, it's quite striking when you read his speeches to female audiences in the 1930s and 40s. You're hearing a voice that, I'm sorry to say, in many parts of 21st century India would be considered extraordinarily progressive. So here's a guy who tells women, you know, don't marry early, don't let your parents push you into marriage. When you do get married, stand up to your husbands. You are their equal. You're not there just to serve them. Uh, make sure that you're not coerced into having too many children too early. You should have control over the children you have. When he was in the Bombay legislature, he tried to introduce a bill to promote birth control. And needless to say, the conservatives shot it down. He lost that, uh, that attempt. But he was thinking way ahead of his time on these matters. He also did something um, to push for equal wages for women laborers. And, and he succeeded in that effort to try and getting, get, to, to get similar terms and conditions, including leave rights, maternity leave, and so on. 
This is a man who was constantly thinking of, of how much uh, women needed to be able to be empowered. So he was thinking of empowerment uh, at all levels. Uh, and, and gender and caste, I think, in his mind, were both different faces of a same sort of disability. I would say that it was quite remarkable because people weren't talking like that in those days. And one of the extraordinary things about Ambedkar is that he was doing this and he was doing this as a man, um, using his sort of pulpit in talking, for example, to gatherings of Dalit women. He's the one who told them to wear their saris in the way that upper caste women did, for example, uh, which was a, a transformation given the way in which the pallu was worn in those days and that sort of thing. So there's a tremendous amount of consciousness that women need to be uplifted before uh, Dalit men can feel that their fight for freedom is fully successful. Um, Sumit, uh, you know, I want to come back to something that you were talking about. Um, I think one of the most fascinating things about your book is that you write a micro history of where you come from, right? The cultural, historical, social, uh, sort of context uh, of the Desia region and of the subaltern Christian tradition that you were born into. And uh, that made me think about how we often tend to talk in India or even internationally as the Dalit movement as a monolith, Dalit rights movement as a monolith, right? When it's, it's really not. And when we talk about Ambedkarism, we think for most of Maharashtra, we think of Uttar Pradesh. Um, how do you see Baba Sahib Ambedkar's role in shaping Dalit consciousness and Dalit right movements across India, uh, given the nuances of Dalit struggles across the country? I mean, when uh, Ambedkar started Muk Nayak, um, he uh, introduces the first editorial of Muk Nayak by uh, referring to a poem by Tukaram, who was a local saint uh, from Maharashtra. And there he talks about um, the, voiceless, the voiceless people are not heard, and I want them to speak. And uh, he starts off saying that Dalits are um, at the worst receiving end of the social discrimination that is in India. Um, and that is what I'm going to highlight. That is what I'm going to hi highlight. And their redemption lies in self-emancipation. And that is a statement that he uses. Um, after that, he starts building institutions, like hostels, schools, colleges. Uh, after Muknayak, he starts Bhaiskrit Bharat, Janta, Samta. Uh, he also starts an organization called Bhaiskrit Hitkarni Sabha uh, to, to raise consciousness of Dalits. And at, that, at, at those times, um, the ideas of karma and dharma that you know whatever your state of life now is it is because of your past karma you know whatever god, your state of life is because god has ordained it right and he was trying to move them out of that that he was trying to move them out of mental slavery and amitka says the first step towards freedom is to realize that you're enslaved that's what amitka said and for that he started uh, Organizing, like I said, newspapers. Newspapers. He also, uh, you know, accuses the mainstream newspapers at those points of time of not talking about them. Uh, he mo goes to Karnataka, Maharashtra, Goa, organizes events, uh, talks to people, um, and makes them aware of their rights, right? To reclaim their human personality. That is what he calls it. That they should realize what their rights are, and their rights are not going to be through God. You know, it's not going to come through some god on temple entry or this esoteric uh, uh, philosophical things. It's pure and simple. It's going to come through education and political rights. And that is when uh, he uh, goes before Sim Simon Commission. Of course, at that point of time, uh, Congress is protesting. Um, and uh, uh, at that, uh, you know, Raul attacked and uh, all of that is happening. And he's going there and demanding, adult franchise is going there and demanding um, a reservation. Most of the Dalit organizations at that point of time, they demanded separate electorate. Ambedkar said, no, joint electorate with adult franchise is what is demanding, right? And that is something that I see today in India. If you go to Tamil Nadu, there is some uh, filmmaker called Paranjit. And Tamil Nadu, there is, uh, there is a beautiful article written by Hugo Gorange and uh, one guy called Damodaran who talk about Madurai film, Madurai film formula, where the, film, the films are all about dominant caste masculinity. 
you know, where uh, even people like Kamal Hassan have acted, Tevar Magan, you know, dominant caste pride. Now Paranjit, people like Paranjit who have taken those inspiration and they have started building their own institutions, cultural institutions to talk about history in their own way. Right? Academic, in academia you see a lot of people doing it, but culturally it's something that he is doing. There's somebody called Anup Kumar in Varda. He realizes that the primary education system is very, very bad in India and, uh, and that is what creates a lot of obstacles when you go to colleges, when you go to university, your English is not good. You know, you're not trained properly uh, in your school life. And so he trains them for free, right? And th this is done by a community which has no resources. I mean, Dalits don't have land. Majority of Dalits in this country don't have land. So they don't have capital to invest in organizations and institutions. And whatever money and, uh, you know, whatever institution is being built, it is built through community support. And uh, through the small middle class that has come, a tiny section of them also contribute in making these institutions possible, right? And so this is where I strongly believe that uh, that the state should take, the state should own, own it up, right? I was uh, recently uh, reading a, a standing committee report from 2015 or 16 um, on SCT Prevention of Atrocities Act. The conviction rate is so low. The conviction rate on SHD prevention of adversity is very, very low. And the standing committee says that it is because of the willful negligence of the officers, of uh, you know, other caste members, who take special interest in their, uh, in their own class. And that is something Ambedkar had told, you know, um, that law is of no avail to you until and unless the social and moral conscience of the society protects it. And that is what we see today. Ambedkar believed in state so much and I'm, uh, I remember Tarur, Mr. Tarur saying Ambedkar believed in state so much, state so much, but I don't think it is the Dalits who are misusing the state. It is the dominant caste officers and politicians. I wish, despite having special courts, we have so low conviction rate. I think they should be able to use it better and which they're not doing. And in a society like India, um, and let me make this one point, when Hatras happened, when Hatras happened in Uttar Pradesh, a Dalit girl was raped by Apakas men, uh, murdered, and then uh, in the middle of the night he was, she was burnt. Um, the very next day, the Apakas organization came, Savarna Parisar, the Thakur Parisar, all of them came to the street, saying, how can you blame us? I mean, even after committing violence, they're coming out there and saying, look, we've done it. You cannot do anything to us, right? And I'm coming from Chennai. Just two days back, I was speaking to a Dalit advocate who's been fighting for land, Panchami land, uh, for Dalits there. Even he's been saying that the society is not going to give you. So even if the state has failed miserably, there's this glimpse of hope that you, can, you could approach the state because, you know, because you're part of, you're part of India and the constitution guarantees you those rights and you can approach the state, right? So in that, that way, it's like the lesser evil or the, you know, the, the, the good or bad. I mean, it's lesser evil or better evil sort of a thing, I believe. Yeah. You know, the way Sumit uh, talks about how caste continues to inform identity and continues to be systematically written out of all the important discourses and debates we're having, it obviously begs the question, what if, Dr. Tharoor? Um, I want to ask you about, again, this is a big question, but uh, how you see Ambedkar's con you know, contribution to laws to the Constitution um, and uh, to the politics uh, of this country as it's shaped up? Well, on the, on the question of the Constitution, his impact was considerable because as chairman of the drafting committee, he was the person who had to actually approve the final text of every article, present it to the Constituent Assembly, listen to the objections and questions and answer, which he did for every single one of the articles of what, is, what was then the world's longest Constitution. So I think it's very difficult to give anyone else a fraction of the credit. Besides which, as T.T. Krishnamachari famously said, there were seven members in the drafting committee. From one was dead and was not replaced. One was on sort of mission in the United States. Two others were sent off to other states on duty. He went through the list and said, finally, essentially, the, the drafting committee was one man. and it was, it was Ambedkar. So he would get an enormous amount of the credit. I think three or four important things are worth highlighting. I think he struck an extraordinary balance between standing up for the rights of his oppressed community on the one hand and insisting on individual agency and autonomy for the citizen on the other. That is that 
the British had ruled us as a collection of communities. So Muslims could only vote on a separate electoral list for Muslim candidates for reserved Muslim seats. So it was always that. Entire communities were classified as criminal tribes. Entire communities were classified as martial races. I mean, that was the way the British saw us, as a collection of different groups of people, and they ruled us that way. The Constitution shifts India away from that kind of thinking into a land of individual citizens with their own rights, including the right that every adult now had to cast a vote, which was again unprecedented. The British had so many strict qualifications of literacy and property ownership and so on, that when they left the last election they conducted in 1946, we had a population of 300 million in India, only 30 million were eligible to vote. So that's, that's the difference between their approach and the kind of universal rights that, that Ambedkar guaranteed. Second, I would say that this injection, uh, somebody talked about liberty, equality, and fraternity. Um, and and Ambedkar believed in all of those, particularly equality, because he felt it didn't exist in Indian society. And fraternity is something he emphasized much more than we all realize. The idea that we are essentially brothers and we need to get along with each other and treat each other with the kind of respect that fraternity requires and which, frankly, uh, as Sumit has been pointing out, has not fully uh, come to exist yet in Indian society. A third significant contribution that Ambedkar made was, of course, this question of reservations for Dalits and for scheduled tribes. Uh, it, it became subsequently a matter of controversy, but his argument was it's the only way that you can undo uh, millennia of, of discrimination and injustice. So you needed to guarantee not only access or opportunity, which is what, say, subsequent Western affirmative action programs do, you need to guarantee outcomes. So you reserve 85 seats in parliament to these two communities. You reserve seats in government, in, uh, in universities, in medical colleges, all of that. And that, I think, was a significant contribution, which today has become universally accepted, even though at the time there was still some resistance. Um, it emerges to some degree from the Pune Pact with Mahatma Gandhi, but goes beyond it. And I would say that all of those things we're still living with. Um, some of his other contributions are more challengeable. I mean, one that Sumit has also alluded to. Uh, he was very much a top-down kind of man. He rejected Mahatma Gandhi's notion of these idealized, self-governing village, uh, villages uh, sort of running India. And so you will find no mention of Panchayati Raj in the Ambedkar constitution. And Ambedkar said very clearly, that this Gandhian notion is essentially untenable because our villages are dens of ignorance, iniquity, superstition, and discrimination. And therefore, we will not empower the villages. We will empower the central government, which will essentially then do sort of top-down development because we are more enlightened than those guys down there. And that obviously is a debatable proposition. But it's partially because of his strong views on this that it was only in the early 90s that Panchayati Raj became a reality with the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments. And you can, you can talk about many things that he, he wanted to go much farther on, on, on social reform, for example. Uh, he wanted very much uh, the Hindu, uh, what became the controversial Hindu code bill, and he wanted it to contain much more than it eventually it did contain. But he ran up against massive resistance from the conservative interests, and this became a genuine problem because it ultimately led to his resignation from the cabinet because he felt that the prime minister was not backing him sufficiently, which I thought was a slightly unfair criticism because Nehru was actually very sympathetic to Ambedkar's point of view, but Nehru couldn't get it past the conservative interests in the Congress party at the time. And, and, and so in the end, Ambedkar resigned and resigned in some bitterness, feeling that the Hindus would never allow reform to take place. He had said memorably, that um, we are trying to impose a top dressing of democracy upon a, a, a soil that is essentially undemocratic. And, and so his whole idea, he said, you know, in this constitution, we're bringing in one man, one vote, or one person, one vote. But in our society, we don't have one person, one value. So we need to bring about social reform. And that's why he felt that if you couldn't get the Hindu code bill, you are going to be, as he put it very memorably, he had a great talent for words. He said, you are going to be building a palace upon a dung heap. 
As you know, Nehru was pushing economic reform, abolition of zamindari, more distribution of wealth across to the poor and so on. But he's saying you're doing that without touching the unjust social order, and that's the palace upon a dung heap. One thing that Sumit alluded to, the, the reference to Santukaram is very important. I use uh, a verse that Ambedkar was very fond of as the epigraph to my book because uh, his father had exposed him to Tukaram when he was a child. And one of Tukaram's verses says that words are all we have. Words are the weapons, it's through words. Words are our wealth. Words are, are essentially what those who have your words give us our voice and the power of words is something. So Ambedkar was a, a massive producer of words because for him, words were the gods he worshipped. It was really quite an extraordinary, um, extraordinary thing he did. And I, I will say that if you look back on all of this, <coughs> there's, a, there's a lot that he contributed to. If I may add two more thoughts since you asked specifically about constitution politics. One is, um, and this will amuse some of us today who are used to a very different Indian politics. He said openly in a speech at the time when the constitution had, had been agreed to be adopted. It was formally uh, adopted on the 26th of January, but the actual constitutional process came to an end in November of 49. <coughs> and he said, you know, all these methods of dharna and civil disobedience and satyagraha and hartals and so on were fine when we were doing it against a foreign power. But now that we have created a democracy, we should not resort to these methods again because that would merely be the grammar of anarchy. And to think that that's one thing that everyone continued doing uh, after a made. So the grammar of anarchy in many ways would be the description of the state of, of much of our politics of protest even today. The, the other uh, very interesting uh, contribution that, uh, that he made that echoes today is he warned against majority rule. And he said, don't forget that in this country, the majority is really a communal majority and not a political majority. And the need for the majority to be consciously aware of the rights of minorities could not be greater in a country like India. And he also mentioned, by the way, that all political majorities are essentially temporary and government should not forget that. And so the need for safeguards to ensure that these temporary majorities did not ride roughshod over the rights of everybody else was something that he was brilliant at articulating. So I'd say all of those would be the contributions that, uh, that one would particularly highlight and that emerge very much from, from, from this, this short biography that I've, I've tried to write. Absolutely. Um, one last quick question before I open it up to the audience and you'll really, forgive me, have um, just a minute to answer this, but I think it's kind of important, um, which is the question of sort of how we, which is the question of sort of how we sort of tend to deliberately or otherwise misinterpret his legacy and his life and of course his words and ideas in today's uh, times. I'll start with you, Sumit, and uh, Dr. Tharoor, you can end on this. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, you write about appropriation of not just Ambedkar's uh, legacy, but also uh, Dalit's stories. And you mentioned this earlier. I mean, some of it happens simply because we've been talking about this. The media, there's, there, there just isn't representation. There isn't storytelling that's coming from within the community enough. Um, can you talk a little bit about how across ideological spectrums this has continued to happen and often the best of us um, seem blind to it, including you know, people like myself? Um. Yes, when it comes to uh, misinterpretation, mi misinterpretation of Ambedkar's ideas and uh, or you know even appropriation of his ideas, I think I'll it, it'll be better if I start off uh, across political spectrum. Um, BJP is trying really, really hard. RSS is re trying really, really hard to appropriate Ambedkar, right? And uh, um, and with no sources, they cite. Uh, I mean, their sources themselves, right? Datopan Tengadi, there's this guy who says that uh, Ambedkar was, Ambedkar had visited, uh, you know, Ambedkar had visited uh, Savarkar. He said, look, you know, you're fighting against Chaturvani, you're doing good. Uh, and uh, one of the Hindu Mahasava member was part of Sarilka's Federation election and all of that, and the sources themselves, right? Um, and Ambedkar very clearly said, Ambedkar, Ambedkar very clearly said, Hindu Mahasabha at that point of time was a reactionary organization, 
he said rss is a danger in his journals that you'd see in his newspapers you'd see um the articles after articles against um i mean against this sort of you know aggressive hindu milit you know militant politics shama prasad mukherjee was completely against ambedkar in in the constitution constitution assembly debate right and for a very long time now they are trying to uh, and they try to pick up so ambedkar was very critical of even muslims you know some of the aggressive politics uh, practices that muslims did so what rss does is rss try and now coming to left i mean in the 1940s when ambedkar is writing about socialists at that point of time uh, ambedkar is i mean left as i mean socialist communist both socialist is saying that the power doesn't just lie in property power also lies in religion your social status and that is what ambedkar is concentrating to focus and he says that you need to talk about this i mean there is a base and there is a structure right there is a base and there is a building and if you want to uh, remove the building you also have to you know uh, remove the building as well right which is the social status and uh, um, other forms of power that exists communists interestingly when ambedkar was asking for um, you know when ambedkar was asking for separate electorate uh, communists were saying that he is fighting for a mundane co cause of the harijans right at that point of time and ambedkar's idea was that the communists at that point of time were considering only the industrial workers because industrialization was going on and this they used to consider only the industrial workers as workers as the proletariat not the untouchable workers not the untouchables as workers okay that was a major point of difference but uh, i won't go further I I just give it Schmidt, just to add that can i finish yeah yeah, yeah. um and then last um i think to do with congress and i think this is where i have my difference with mr sachit tarur uh, in his book right a uh, three points i have and since you represent congress as well so i know this is uh, common my, my books are not written by the congress yes, party yes but there's a lot of views that is influenced by congress yes um first thing is uh, of course uh, mr sachit tarur's idea of hinduism and that is where uh, i differ i mean i come from a tradition which believes that there was nothing called hinduism that existed for eternity it was nothing like that the way i believe it i mean chronologically there was a pre aryan indus civilization then there was a vedic civilization and which ended up with upanishads and so on and so forth there was a clear cut distinction between the vedic brahmanic tradition and then the shramanic tradition which you call it and what was shramanic tradition buddhism ajivika the lokayata philosophies and all of them which denounced the authority of vedas which denounced caste which gave dignity to laborers laborers right and these are the contradictions even in the 11th 10th century you see people like alberuni talking about it you know you see patanjali talking about it patanjali is saying that the fight between brahmins and uh, the shramans is like the cat and mouse it's like the snake and mongoose that's what he's saying uh he went saying and uh, many other even i mean it's not just dalit saying i'm i'm saying romila thapar rs sharma uh, dp chatterjee gc pande all of them dd kosambi is referring to all this right my 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 difference of opinion with you is that there is a variety of religions and practices and traditions that exists in india which are subaltern religions which are subaltern religions or in you know the tradition that i come from we call it dalit bhojan religions right and which continues you know basavana from 12th century alphine said basavana uh, ravidas kabir nanak this is the tradition and over a period of time what has happened is the brahmanic practices also have infested into this so when ambedkar was talking as hinduism he was clearly talking about brahmanism the vedic brahmanism the supremacy of brahmins the authority of the vedas and caste that is what he was talking about he was not talking about all this um, practices of tukaram guru ravidas kabir nanak all this and these are difference that we need to clearly make and in the end i think you make a contradictory statement you said that ambedkar is ambedkar has denounced hinduism and that is one of his biggest flaws but when ambedkar is converted to buddhism you are saying in that i remember you're saying ambedkar is still in the hindu fold right so if he is already in, if according to you buddhism is a, buddhism is a hindu buddhism is within the heterodox tradition of quote unquote hinduism then you shouldn't be saying he has denounced hinduism that's a contradictory statement right and this one last point sorry um the last one point that i want to make here uh is uh, 
is that, okay, I'll give you one example from Kerala, Sabarimala temple. And recently there was an article in Caravan, the Mala Aryas, the Adivasis are saying that it is the Brahmins who took over our temple 100 years back. Right? RSS is going to Arunachal Pradesh is saying a Mongoloid figures as this is the Mongoloid Siva. Right? So this is the, this, the, these practices have happened over a period of time and this is a difference that we need to make. And just one difference, uh, I mean, I didn't like that statement when Mr. Taru said that, you know, Ambedkar was against Bhakti, Ambedkar was against, uh, you know, hero worship and all that, which I agree. Right? And you, you, you're saying that his followers have become devotees. Right? I mean, if today you see you go to any libraries across India, you know, any Ambedkarite organizations across India, if you, I mean, meetings you go, you'll find books. You'll find a lot of books, you know, books on the roads, in vernacular literature. I mean, I was astonished when I went to Tamil Nadu, I found books of uh, Herbert Risley, you know, which is like an anthropologist, right? They're reading books. And when are they coming to the streets? When they represent Ambedkar, they're saying that we are against caste violence. The Safai Karamcharis are coming to the street holding Ambedkar's portrait. They are saying, this is what Ambedkar represents to us. Ambedkar represents dignity to us. Dignity to us. When the Dalits in Una are coming to the street, they are saying, Gai ki puch tum raklo, zameen hame de do. So they are asking for land rights. Right? So, and when even during the CANRC protests, Muslim women are holding Ambedkar. Why? Because they believe that Ambedkar, Ambedkar, Ambedkar is, you know, Ambedkar drafted the constitution and Ambedkar introduced the idea of equal citizenship for everybody. So that is what Ambedkar represents. And, uh, and like, you know, you yourself go to, you, you go to temple, you believe in a lot of superstitions and those practices, you break coconuts, you talk about Lord Parsurama, all those mythologies, uh, and, um, and also, um, you know, these are, these are almost as if these are self-evident truths, right? These are not, see, this is the funny thing, you know, the Tamil Brahmins, they will go, they'll go to Silicon Valley, they'll come back, They'll stay in their own segregated localities, you know, talk about classical music and all of that, practice all sort of caste practices and superstition practices, but they're modern. The Bengalis will go to Oxford, they'll talk about subaltern politics, and they'll come to Durga Puja, they'll dance, they'll sing, do all of that. That is not blind practice. But Ambedkar's followers, illiterate people who are coming to the streets, who are coming to the streets, and who are trying to educate themselves, moving away from all of this, they have become devotees. And that is what I don't agree. We have very little time. Dr. Tharoor, you have uh, two questions to take now. You have to respond to him and get to appropriation if you can. I'm sorry, I have to give him uh, the last uh, word. I so think it's only really fair to have the right Thank of you. Yes. <laughs> Since my dear Sumit's uh, one, one minute took about seven or eight, I, I should at least take one or two back. Uh, first, I actually agree with most of what he said, so I don't know where the contradiction is, because in fact, my point was not that Ambedkar was wrong in what he critiqued, but that his critique of Hinduism was too sweeping. That is that when he said, for example, uh, the famous line, you know, there might be a better or worse Hindu, but a good Hindu there cannot be. I mean, that, shall we admit, is a rather sweeping denunciation, that Hinduism does embrace everyone from Chokhamela to Ravidas, uh, and, and that the Hinduism of the Bhakti movement, the Hindu, Hinduism of all the, the different traditions. I mean, the, you cannot, on the one hand, accuse the Brahmins of having assimilated everyone and everything, and on the other hand, then say that they are only intolerant. It's been an evolving faith. Every, every, everything in India has evolved over, over, the, over the millennia, and so has, so has Hinduism, and it's absorbed a lot. It's been an agglomerative faith that has taken in all of these things. Jagannath in Puri started off as a tribal deity and has been assimilated into, into it, appropriated, quite right. But therefore, it's now part of Hinduism as well. So the, all I'm saying is that to acknowledge that eclecticism and liberalism of the appropriation is missing. But I agree with Sumit in almost everything else he said. He is right about the appropriation by the Hindutva movement, which is, flies completely in the face of Ambedkar's denunciations of Hinduism. He, there's also been appropriation by the left, and he's right that Ambedkar, I just want to add, and I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, saying that in addition to what you said, Ambedkar's intellectual critique was that class is not a sufficient argument to explain Indian social reality. The problem with the left, he said, is they see everything in lines of class, whereas in India, caste is an even more pervasive reality than class. And therefore, the intersection of class and caste ought to be considered, which the communists were not prepared to do. And indeed, EMS Nambudhivad famously denounced him, saying, why is he diverting the freedom movement with the mundane issues of Harijans? 
because they hadn't understood that the, the issue of the Dalits was, was so fundamental. So again, the, that was the quarrel between Ambedkar and the, and the communists. So the fact that everybody who he was, who was, he was in argument with at that time subsequently has sought to appropriate his mantle is a tribute. It's, it's if you like, a left-handed tribute right now, but it's a tribute to how, how much of an icon he has become and how much above all of this. So ultimately, I would say that uh, a lot of what Sumit says stands its own ground quite validly. Some of these issues are still evolving. Some of these uh, debates still have to be debated. Some of these fights have to be fought. But the very fact that so many different elements are trying to lay claim to Ambedkar is, to my mind, proof of Ambedkar's victory. He has essentially put his arguments and the example of his own life at a plane which no one can afford to denounce or pull down. That's a long way from where he stood when he passed away. And I think we ought to really applaud what has happened to the legacy of Ambedkar. I, I respect uh, uh, Sumit's fight. I think he slightly misunderstood some of the things I've written, but this is not the, the time to, to go into every... <laughs> we, can, we can talk about that. But, but I, I do stand by uh, my words as well as my complete admiration for what Ambedkar did, despite the fact that when you admire somebody, you don't have to agree with every single thing that he stood for and agree with. And, and in my case, I, you know, they don't. I think, I think that on his quarrel with Gandhiji, I could agree with a number of the things that he, that he differed with Gandhiji on, uh, while disagreeing profoundly with the ungraciousness with which he expressed them, particularly after the Mahatma's death, which I thought was unfortunate and unworthy of, of a great man. Uh, similarly, on the statism that, uh, that Sumit alluded to, I think that, that top-down directiveness uh, has its limitations. I think there's a case that Dalits will soon start making for decentralizing authority much more to the lowest units where they too can have a larger voice. Uh, similarly, on Hinduism, I just think the denunciations were so sweeping, there's much more that can be done. And finally, I thought there was a certain lack of sympathy for the Adivasis, which honestly, uh, again, Ambedkar is a better man than that. He, he, could have, he could have extended himself a little more. He often found he was speaking of Adivasis in the way in which upper caste was speaking of Dalits, and neither should have happened. But these are the criticisms that show that I have approached Ambedkar not as, not as a hagiographer, not to sort of put him on a pedestal, uh, not to see him purely in any one prism as a Dalit hero and icon or as a constitution writer alone, but as somebody who taken as a whole led an astonishingly remarkable life, one which every Indian, I think, ought to be aware of and which all of us have every reason to celebrate. Thank you, Dr. Tharu. Thank you, Sumit, for uh, bearing with me, for condensing your ideas in such short a time. Apologies to JLF for overshooting the time. Apologies to all of you that we couldn't take questions. They're not even... Can you see that there are people on the stage? I'm three seconds away from being carried off physically from this stage, but Dr. Tharoor will be signing books. You can get your copies from the bookstore. Sumit's book is unfortunately not available in the book. The fantastic book, Champaka has copies. You can order it online or from Panthers Pod directly. Thank you, all of us. Thank you, all of you. And thank you, Dr. Tharoor and Sumit. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in giving a huge round of applause to Shashi Tharoor, Sumit Samos, and Pragya Tiwari for this interesting conversation. Shashi Tharoor will be signing the book at the book signing desk located on my right hand side at the kiosk. Please uh, help us in keeping the festival venues clean and dispose of your waste in the waste bins placed all across Hotel Clark's Amir. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to hear your views and opinions, so please tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2023 and tag at Jaipur Lit Fest. And please subscribe to the Jaipur Literature Festival YouTube channel to access all the sessions. We begin with the next session shortly. There It concerns a little-known episode about uh, Manilal Gandhi, the son of Mahatma Gandhi, 